And I'm yeah. going to let people Can in. Can also now? remove the waiting room. Does somebody want to take care of that? I think you guys well, I can cannot meet that. all. Uh, let's see. That's Vivian. I don't do this real. Hold on. I, all so, right. And yeah. I'm going to let people Can in. Can also Sure. Did someone let folks in from the waiting room? I can. Yeah, I let them in. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about the waiting room. We got it. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to stop the share and restart it again because it's doing something funky. Hi, folks. We're just getting started. So just give us one sec here and we're going to get going. All right, we are live and I want to welcome everybody to the fourth live session of our Going Native Garden Tour, our fourth virtual session. I am Vivian New, the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society, a long mouthful of words. Um, and I wanted to welcome you to our session. We are excited to have everybody joining us today. Oh. You care about seeing all the gardens. Um, but before I talk about the gardens, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about our chapter. Uh, we are we cover the area from San Jose up to the Mid Peninsula. We love native plants. We love to share information about native plants, and we have a lot of fun events around native plants, including a photography group, um, which has a monthly photo sharing meeting that's open to everybody. And you don't have to be a, a, a professional photographer. If you just like to take pictures, if you just want to see pictures, um, you are welcome to join us. And that's on the second Wednesday of every month at seven o'clock. Uh, it's also a virtual meeting. Um, we also have uh, other events in the planning stage. So I don't have dates for you, but we will be having more of these virtual garden tours and talks and lots of great things. So if you want to tune in for our future sessions, uh, the easiest way to stay on top of what's going on is by joining our chapter news list. And to do that, you just send an email to this address at the bottom of the screen, which is cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. And we send out a weekly message just to let you know what's scheduled and what's coming up. I also wanted to mention that if you're inspired to add some plants to your garden or you just are looking for plants, our chapter's nursery uh, isn't we, we used, used to have monthly sales, but we aren't able to do that right now. So we have gone virtual. You can order plants from us online and we will deliver them to you. Um, you do have to live between Belmont and San Jose, but um, we, will, we deliver about once a week. So you can place your order and you should get your plants within the week. Um, you can also, if you love the GNG t-shirts and you've been admiring all the various beautiful um, shirts from, that you've seen over the years. We have many of them available to order in our store now. So you just go to this uh, address at the bottom, California-Native-Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley Chapter um, Nursery, and you can go and, and shop. Um, you can also just go to our chapter website, which is cnps-scv.org. And all of these places, the news, the store, a lot of other great resources are available there. And you can just go from there. Um, so now on to our gardens. Um, we have three amazing gardens. Our first one is Nancy McClenny's garden, the McClenny Hol Hol Holcomb garden, and that's in Palo Alto. Um, it's going to be followed by Penny Pollock's garden, and Penny is the chair of the Going Native Garden Committee, and that garden is located near Allen Rock Park. 
And then we'll be wrapping up with Stephanie Morris's garden, which is in Campbell. And then a little bit of logistics about how we run these sessions. We have a lot of people, so we, we would prefer people not to try to ask questions out loud uh, during the presentation, but you are welcome to type questions, whether you are with us through YouTube or on Zoom, please just type your question into the chat box. And we have folks monitoring chat on both YouTube and Zoom. And as each presenter finishes up, the, all the questions that are in the chat will be um, read out by our co-host and uh, get answered at the end of each presentation. So do please feel free to ask questions. We love talking about native plants and sharing our knowledge. So uh, don't hesitate if you see something that you want to know more about. Um, and so we're going to be starting with Nancy. And uh, Nancy, if you want to take over the screen, go ahead. And let me. And uh, let's see here. Whoops. Nancy, I think you're muted. So just a little bit above about Nancy, she inherited her love of plants from her father, and he was a vocational agriculture teacher in high school. So he also tended their home garden and was trained as a clinical laboratory technologist with a specialty in mycology and myco micro, I mean, sorry, she's a clinical laboratory technologist with a specialty in mycology and mycobacteriology. Uh, she worked for five years at SCVMC MC in San Jose and at the Stanford Hospital Clinical Microbiology Vir Virology Laboratory for about 25 years. And then she followed that up with three years as a microbiology lecturer lab instructor for the medical technology postgraduate certification okay. program in San Francisco at San Francisco State. But since then, she's also been taking classes in native plants. Um, the one at Foothill College with Frank Nicola, Nicol, Nicolai. Um, I took that class too. It's an amazing class. If you get a chance to take it, I highly recommend it. Um, and also another one at, with Glenn Peter at Merritt College. Um, she's been on field trips and she's been hiking Bay Area trails. She is just a native plant aficionado. She has an amazing garden. So I, Nancy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Vivian. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank the uh, 2020 Guard, Going Native Garden Tour Committee for their advice and hard work to get this all together tonight. And I'd especially like to, to thank my husband, Jim, whose computer prowess uh, definitely enabled me to be here tonight and do this. So, um, my plan, my plan is to make, take you on a virtual tour of the special plants or special to us plants in our garden with photographs and commentary. All the photographs were taken either by my husband, Jim, or me, and the, but the labels are mine, so I take full responsibility for their accuracy. Uh, we'll be talking about 20% of the 136 native species that we have. I can't believe it either. And only if I can talk fast enough, so I better get started here. Uh, the title of our uh, tour is called Bringing Natives to Our House. And that's in honor of Doug Ptolemy, who's the author of Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. Um, <clears throat> because he inspired me, my thinking uh, in the last few years a lot. And he certainly inspired our title. Uh, I'm going to give how I have five acts to this play, so to speak, and the first one is a brief history of our garden. You'll notice the little subtext down here about a bluebird. Here's a male western bluebird checking out our backyard in June of 2019, and I hope the bluebird adds a little suspense to the goings on here. So keep your eye open for him. Hmm. This is our <clears throat> house in 1998, our front yard. Uh, it was two years before this that we 
given water budget concerns and uh, drought tolerance, we decided to add some drought tolerant plants. And we did some natives and non-natives uh, without too much thought about the, um, that issue. <clears throat> In 2009, uh, we got more serious about adding native plants, which we did, uh, as well as adding a, a dry stream bed and a mound to the front yard. Uh, now we have approximately 75% of our uh, species are native to California. And I just wanted to point out this plant because I won't talk about it later. This is a dwarf baccarus called late San Bruno Lady, uh, which I've finally found as my perfect ground cover. Um, anyway, it's, it's a gorgeous apple green and it attracts lots of, of uh, wildlife. This was a backyard in 1998. Um, we had done some remodeling here, and, um, but we hadn't removed any trees or any of the major plants. So in 2009, we took upon ourselves to do that also. And this is how the garden looked, the backyard looked in May 28th of this year. And I just wanted to point out one thing. Uh, this is John Dooley Manzanita, which makes a really good, um, kind of small or low hedge. Uh, and it's gorgeous because of the, the new leaves are kind of an orange color. This, by the way, is a Rus ovata, which you'll see just in a minute. In 2018, we had what is called a big event, at least in <laughs> garden terms. Um, our very shady holly oak or Corcus elix that's been in the garden, was going in the garden since about 1965 uh, or 55 maybe, uh, was infected with oat root fungus pretty badly. It was losing leaves, not making new leaves. Uh, also its age was a factor as well as several other uh, considerations. So we decided we needed to remove it. So we did. And <clears throat> this was the result. Um, so the, the oak tree hid the telephone pole and most of the wires, utility wires, which were now, of course, exposed. And also, the sunlight and heat was much more intense as be than before. So we had to kind of start all over, at least in part of the yard, with the plant plantings. Uh, one of the pieces of the trunk fell in the middle of this operation and crashed into our fence, but the company repaired it very quickly and well, so that wasn't a problem. So I'm going to talk about uh, separate groups of plants. Um, trees first for the, we, our purpose there was to um, attract a lot of wildlife and provide shade and privacy at least, well, hopefully fairly soon, if not later. <laughs> uh, here's the female Western bluebird checking out the male Western bluebird, we think. And here is one of the first trees we added to our garden. This is a local native, Prunus illicifolia, subspecies illicifolia, or ho the holly leaf cherry. Uh, I'd seen it on local trails and around, just around several places, even neighborhoods. And uh, it grew from a 10 inch tree pot to a 10 foot tree in about six years. It's absolutely a bee magnet and has lots of nice flowers as you can see. This picture was taken in late April and this, you can see a better view of some of the flowers and the flower buds. And just, I took this last week and you can see the green cherries as they're coming along right at the moment. And just to see what, show you what happens, this was from 2018 in September. And here are the cherries. Quite nice sized cherries. Um, not as good as Bing's, I'm sorry, but that's how it is. 
Uh, Cercocarpus betuloides was another one of the trees I was interested in, interested in. I think I first saw it at Native Hill on the Foothill campus. Uh, it's called the Mountain Mahogany. Uh, and it's useful, especially for narrow spaces. And it's in the corner of our front yard here. We have another, a second one that's been trimmed as a uh, standard tree by an excellent pruner. And we've enjoyed seeing those develop. A real attraction to uh, Circocarpus is this long, hairy, quote, tail attached to the seed. Here's the seed right here. And this was where their flower was. And this is actually the style of the flower that's elongated. And then these little hairs are produced on each side. And this helps to disperse uh, the organism, the seeds of the organism, either by wind or uh, attaching to the fur of animals. Rusovada I tried three times. And three, the third time was the charm. Um, this is the sugar bush. It's a hardy evergreen shrub from Southern California. And uh, in the backyard here, it tolerates the now full sun and high heat we get. And can be pruned to a single or multi trunk tree, which we probably will do soon. Here are its flower buds. We saw these on a trail in the Bay Area. And uh, each one of these little buds will produce a white flower. And then um, it'll, they will, this is the plant uh, at home, and it produced a few berries this year, uh, which we found out the Native Americans um, used for lemony beverage. And now that the leaves curl up, Matt Ritter, um, who just published a book about California plants, called these, these leaves tacos. So this is the taco leaf. The Circocarpus, I mean, sorry, the Circus occidentalis uh, had been planted for quite a while, for about 10 years. And uh, it's an all season tree. It's deciduous in the winter, but um, as you see here, I, it has dark, deep pink flowers that come onto the branches in the spring, uh, on, even before the, the leaves bud out. And after the flowers are gone, then the seed pods remain. And they're still on the tree today, just like this. And I mentioned from in the other slide that this uh, Circus is one of those plants that can be coppiced or cut back to practically the, the ground and it will respire. Um, I love to research plants. And so I wanted a desert plant to see if I could it would respond well to the heat and the, and the sunlight here. So I chose Chilopsis linearis. Uh, it was, this one is a selection from the wild by Warren Jones, uh, after whom it's named. Uh, the common name is Desert Willow and uh, it's a native of Southern California and the California deserts as well as several other Southwestern states. This is the flower bud early and this is the flower bud after the flowers start blooming at the bottom of this pack of buds, interestingly. We don't know much about it. We don't know if it'll work, but we'll see. We're going along for the ride. And you might be wondering, well, what did she replace the holly oak with? We, have, we got lots of advice from, from very savvy professionals and I researched it a lot on my own. And I decided finally on Lionosamnus floribundus subspecies Asplenifolius. Uh, we saw this recently on a trail in Portola Valley, but apparently it was planted there by someone because this tree is native to the California Channel Islands. And guess what happened? We decided to plant our tree in this early spring. And then we had that surprise heat wave early on, if I'm sure you remember that, which strongly suggested to us that we needed um, some kind of shade cloth. So we put this over the, the tree. Jim constructed this uh, tent 
and uh, the tree is looking great. It's growing and it's not getting any more yellow leaves. So that will help us through to the first summer. And by the way, we didn't take our own sage advice of waiting until the fall to plant it. We were impatient, not good. So now the shrubs. Uh, we are interested, we have lots, as I've just mentioned, full sun in the backyard. In the front yard, really a mixed bag, part shade in the front of the house and then full sun in the afternoon uh, for some of the plants. How is the bird doing? Well, the bluebird, the male bluebird was just really unhappy with this morning dove invading his territory as well as lots of other kinds of birds. The good news about the tree not being there is we can see what these birds are up to. And it's quite fun. Um, I was so distressed by having all these plants, native plants that ended in berry, twin berry, service berry, also berry, huckleberry, et cetera, et cetera. So I tried to, decided to try some. This is a, a Melanchier alnifolia or the service berry. It grows maybe up to 16 feet. It has white, simple flowers. With, it's a rose, it's in among the rose family. And it has berries, quite significant sized berries that um, turn dark brown, dark blue uh, when they're mature. You can see that pack of berries right here again. Um, the birds love them, the butterflies like them, and they're edible to humans also. You can see that I ate that one right there and I liked it. It was lightly sweet and I found out that actually I think it's in the Midwest that is is used as a food crop still. Amazing. As we go from the north side of the house to the backyard, the first shrub to get full sun is the salvia apiana or the white sage. It's a dramatic looking, fast growing uh, Southern California type shrub with long flower stalks and these gorgeous lavender and white blossoms and these beautiful gray green leaves, fuzzy, fuzzy leaves. Here it is as we see it actually today and uh, it grows to about six or seven feet wide when it's in full bloom and then it gets cut back for space reasons. <laughs> Probably my, the, the bush that I'm most impressed with, the shrub I'm most impressed with is Areogonum fasciculatum or the California buckwheat. Um, this is um, a shrub indigenous to the Bay Area. Uh, it's a magnet for bees and butterflies. And the flower type is like this. And it's called an umble, which by the way, is the Latin word for umbrella. Hence the fact that this is shaped like an umbrella, upside down, that is. And it's in, getting into full bloom uh, now. I didn't mean 6.30 down there. I think I meant 5.30, 2020. Okay, and uh, did I say that it was the most widespread buckwheat in California? And this are the these are the flowers up close and personal. They're just exquisite, each one of them. Salvia malvasium is um, a ribes that I said, I meant ribes malvasium or the chaparral current is uh, a, a ribes species that's supposed to take more sun than uh, ribes sanguinium. And it does here. Uh, it was in the shade of the oak tree too. So we're hoping that will maintain its vigor and it looks good so far. It may grow to five to eight feet. I think it's about seven here. And lots of wildlife are attracted to it. Here's the flower, which in, comes in early, actually winter, late winter, early spring, and they're pink. And here are the berries, which are hanging on the tree as we speak. Um, they're edible for us humans, but um, they were, Bland, I thought, and a little bit too seedy for me, so I'll pass. 
Here's a shrub in the front yard. It gets shade in the morning. Uh, it's Peritoma arborea. Uh, the common name is bladder pod. Uh, it's a pleasing shrub, I think, with mostly year, with year round uh, yellow blossoms and seed pods. The seed pod, if you can see my little black cursor, is right here. And it will sell seed eventually, not yet, but eventually. There is an up close look at the flower. It's fast, it's easy, it's drought tolerant once established, and it has few pests. Okay, here's another berry, berry shrub. This one's called twin berry, Lunacera involucrata. Uh, very colorful with uh, twin flowers, yellow flowers, sometimes red. This one has some red markings. And you'll know that the bracts, the um, part of the flower at the base of the flower are turning from green to red. And you see them again here. Uh, this, this season we got only one, a few berries, not very many because we, I think because we just moved this shrub, transplanted it to a different area. So it quite, wasn't quite up to speed. Anyway, uh, the berries are usually in pairs. Oh, and the holodiscus discolor. We have enjoyed this so much. Uh, it was surprisingly full bloom this year, which we didn't expect. This is a local shrub um, called ocean spray. Another word, common name is cream bush. And it is a big shrub. It's very graceful with uh, kind of wilting branches. Um, so, which I didn't have room for. So we decided to put it on a trellis and it's done very well on the trellis. It's actually at peak bloom right now. And I uh, took this picture just two days ago. The bumblebees love it. I was hoping to get a video, but I did not, sorry. Bumblebees travel fast. Symphoricarpus albus levigata, uh, gatus, is the snowberry, which is also a local native. You see them on lots of trails. They have these long branches with opposite leaves uh, that then uh, kind of gracefully fall over. So you have a graceful shrub. Here is the flower, tiny flower, which you see here again. And here are snowberries on the trail at Arrestadera Preserve um, in September. So we have those to look forward to at home. This is a Southern California shrub called Cacalia cordifolia or the climbing pinstemon. And I just wanted to add it because it's easy as spelliade. Uh, it, it produces flowers at the end of the branches when they reach lots of light. And uh, the hummingbirds love these flowers, red, orange flowers. Here is a, um, one of their multi-flowered blooms at the end of the branch. Ah, so the blue, male bluebird got so angry <laughs> with the morning dove, it actually drove him off of the wire. Okay, so perennials. Um, Anisocarpus medioides, or the woodland tarweed, is uh, a local native that I bought seed of just because. Uh, and I was really surprised it, it grew to six feet tall the first uh, season. It received well, and I really, we've really enjoyed it. Uh, here is a plant. I'm not sure where the, I'm not sure if you're seeing this additional um, screen here on top of my screen. Anyway, this is an Angelica tomentosa or the woolly Angelica. It's a lo local perennial with a tap root. And we were surprised by the presence of these large umbels of flowers. 
here's a very short video with just to show the insects flying around these flowers. There was just loaded with with little insects about 4.30 in the afternoon, one afternoon. Uh, everyone should have a Pinstemon heterophilus, um, heterophilus margarita bop. Back, B O P stands for back off porch. And this is the, my favorite um, cultivar. It's easy to grow, it's local, it attracts a wild, wide range of wildlife, and it's low enough to be kind of in the front of the border or mid border. This is a usual perennial that um, I actually, I think, bought at the Regional Parks Botanic Garden long ago. Geomacrophyllum, or the big leaves avens, is a perennial from the Sierra, but it does well here in Power Shade, and it sells seeds. So for one plant, I have now have three. And here it is as it's going to seed. And the last perennial I'll share with you is another special one to me, Dicentra formosa or Pacific Bleeding Heart. It's a perennial for shade. It's indigenous to Santa Clara County and uh, it's very easy. And here we have the last act with annuals and a few other plants I wanted to share with you. The bluebird has um, an insect in its beak and so the plot thickens. As far as annuals go, nothing can be poppies. Um, we had a, in our raised bed in the backyard, we have some orange ones with a John Durley between them and some white, uh, white uh, poppies that I grew from seed. I, just as a, a lovely view from the house and the white poppies are still going actually. And you see them here, the bumblebees just love them. And they, they've flowered for a long time now. This one I bought um, online from NC form and it's called buttercream. I made a video of the bumblebees here too, but the, the videos aren't, aren't showing very well. No, it didn't show. Anyway, you saw the flower. So it just shows you the bumblebees kind of rolling around the collecting pollen. Really interesting. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> oh, and Clar Clarkia rubicunda. I think I first saw it at the Russian Ridge uh, Open Space Preserve with these gorgeous pink flowers. Um, they looked on calflora.org and calscape.org, which are two of my favorite websites of, in the world. And <clears throat> it turned out that one of, a specimen was reported as in the late 1800s uh, to is collect, I think the specimen went to a herbarium uh, in California. So it's been around for a while and uh, it's just a wonderful late blooming Clarkia that uh, has a kind of a weeping graceful effect rather than a tall vertical one, like the elegant Clar Clarkia, which we also have in abundance and love it. Um, hmm, I forgot where I got this, maybe at the CNPS sale at Hidden Villa. Uh, Anthoxanthum occidentale, or the California vanilla grass. It's a Bay Area native for shade, and it's just done beautifully, grown wonderful. And when you crush the leaf, you will have a, a fragrance. Um, I think it smells like vanilla, but some people think it smells like other things. So whatever. And uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to show you, uh, share with you Clematis alasiantha or the chaparral clematis. 
the pergola in the backyard uh, was offering no shade for us. So we thought we'd try a fast growing vine that's locally native. So uh, we did this, um, planted this just a year ago and it's already offering a little bit of shade and blooming very well here uh, until just recently and the flowers are about done now. I just wanted to point out, I don't know, I, this, this is a, a label from, anyway, never mind. <laughs> this is technical <laughs> information you don't need. Uh, Clematis lasiantha has one to three flowers per stem. And Clematis lagustifolia has several to many per stem. And I see stems on here of both types. So my best guess is it is a hybrid of Clematis lasiantha, Clematis lagustifolia, but it's doing quite well. I haven't men mentioned uh, succulents, native succulents of which there are many. And this particular Dudleya, one of my favorite genera, um, is actually from Baja, California, but um, Dudleya bretonii. But it's uh, very easily available uh, here in the valley. So, um, and I've, we've enjoyed it quite a bit. It blooms quite nicely. You have to plant it on an angle so that the water doesn't go directly vertically into the center of the plant. And here is surrounded by a late blooming epilobium called Carmen's Gray, which I actually um, purchased originally from Ed Carmen, who had a nursery in Campbell a long time ago when I first moved to California. And here I wanted to show you a favorite scene from the backyard. This, our, our small lawn is actually a native bunch grass called Carex Panza. Uh, we ward it once a month in summer. And it turns out that the golden, it's, it turns dry. If you don't water it a lot, it will turn golden as it would nor naturally do in nature during the summer. And when I see this, I remember the Golden Hills of California, which I first saw in December of, well, I won't tell you the year, but it was a long time ago. And um, I remember seeing hills looking golden, which was just such fun. And so this reminds me of that time when I first came to California. Long story, sorry. And this is a milkweed. This is Asclepius uh, fascicularis. And it's the local milkweed. And this is the uh, shrub now, Eriogonum fascicularis, that's almost in full bloom. And that's it. This is the end of my talk and again, beginning for our little bluebird. We had the nest last spring, uh, was very successful. And this spring, we are into our second batch of bluebirds in this birdhouse. Okay, I'm done. Shall I exit for questions? Yeah, please. Oh, oops. <laughs> oops. Yeah, please. Thanks, Nancy. Yes. Uh, Madeline, are you going to be questions a from the chat? Or uh, Johanna? I was going to let Madeline or Cynthia run it, but if you'd like. I, I have questions from the Zoom and I was gonna check on someone bringing in the ones from YouTube if we wanna get started. Um, why, why don't you go ahead, Madeline? Um, Chris asked the question, one question that was on my mind. Uh, the, your Prunus elisifolia grew very fast in comparison with mine. Um, does it get extra water or amendments? No, it's on a mound that was, was uh, we put in in 2009. So the soil is a bit probably more, um, the drainage is better than it might be otherwise. Other than that, no, it didn't get any extra water in the summer. And I, so I usually um, have a sprinkler going once a month in the summer. 
And so that's what it's gotten. But it was in a tree pot. And my suspicion, maybe not well founded, is that the tree, it grows faster because it was in the uh, tree pot and the root system was pretty strong, relatively speaking. But I may be wrong. Oh, I just want to say that my observation from my years of touring is that gardens in the Palo Alto area, things grow faster than they do in some of the heavier soils further south. So this might be that case. For example, Maybe. I'm going to skip a little, because I was also intrigued to see that your poppies are still in bloom, where mine at 85 and Saratoga have pretty much all gone dormant. So I had another question. Are you giving your poppies extra water? Oh, no. <laughs> they get the same thing, everything, every, all the other plants get. Um, the white one has bloomed longer. There's one plant that must be in the ideal spot because it's blooming, has bloomed for a long time and it's still blooming, but the foliage is very gray and moldy and it's going to seed. And the orange one has already gone to seed. So it's gone. Okay. So, um, Another question was, when you say drought tolerant once established, how long does that take generally? Uh, the rule, I think the rule of thumb that I've heard is that you need to water for the first year, you water every week during the summer, give it supplemental water every, every week, once a week. And uh, if you have a dry winter, you add some supplemental water then too. And then the second year, you some plant. It depends on the plant how long you you water it, but it needs to get established for at least the first year. Okay. Do you agree? I mean, do you have anything else to say? Add, please do. That's. I don't know. Chris is probably an expert on this, but that's kind of been my experience too. Okay. Great. Um. So another burning question, poppies, my poppies from Lynn Rapetsky, it's true, my poppies tend to take over my garden. How do you prevent that from happening? And I guess that would be, be interesting to hear about your, uh, your weed management in general, whether that's a big problem or not. Weed management. Um, my two worst enemies are the oxalis and uh, spurge. And what do I do about, I get them early. That's how I handle my weeds. The poppies, I handle just like I handle the elegant clarkia that we have lots of. I tend to pull out, the, pull out a lot of the buds from the ground when they're very small, when it's very, very, very easy to pull them out. And so I kind of curate where I want my poppy, poppies or or my Clarkia to be, and then just take the rest out physically. Uh, also at the end of their life, when they start going dormant, I will just uh, cut the poppies to the ground so they don't, all of the seeds don't um, uh, mature. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do is just cut them before the seeds mature, but then you don't have those, these plants available for wildlife to use. So it's, it's a conundrum. How many seeds do I get rid of? How many seeds do I leave for the birds or the animals? Um, and I spend a lot of time in the garden, a lot of time that people might not, other people might not have for spending time in the garden. So uh, poppies need to be curated, I would say. And uh, each one has to be treated a little differently. But the poppies have not been a problem. I just pick off the seed heads if they're still flowering. Otherwise, I cut it to the ground and they will probably uh, the plant will probably sprout again for another bloom. Sorry for a long answer. <laughs> um and then there was, you know, so your soil was very clay, right? Okay. So um, you added in some um, softer topsoil, is that correct? Not, uh, not across the board, no. We have one mound in the back and one mound in the front. 
and we had to bring in some soil uh, <clears throat> for to add to our current soil. We just brought the soil in, put it on the mound where we wanted the mound. Uh, the so two soils, the the um, the soil already there was mixed with the new soil well, and then the mound was formed. As far as the rest of the yard, I just use mulch and I've used mulch religiously, routinely uh, since 2009 and the drainage is very good uh, at my house. I, I guess we're lucky, but you know, the mulch is really the trick and having all those oak leaves was really great because I could use those for mulch. So, um, Anyway, mulch, mulch, mulch. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. I mean, is there anybody holding back? Uh, how are we doing for time, Vivian? I lost the, uh, I lost our uh, schedule. Yeah, we're ready to move on if that's, if we're, we're ready for that. Okay. Let me make sure Thank I you. That. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Nancy, that was marvelous. Oops, here we go. Our next garden is Penny Pollux, and she is the chair for our Going Native Garden Tour. She's been a CNPS member for about 10 years, and she joined uh, the tour uh, after she <laughs> had her garden on the tour. Uh, she became coordinator of the, the tour itself. So she was actually a garden owner and uh, a garden participant before she and then she jumped right in and started running the tour and we're so grateful for her for doing that. Um, she also works with Steve Rosenthal who is our former chapter president at Allen Walk on the uh, restoration project there. She's been doing that for about five or six years. Um, she also comes to our nursery and volunteers so she is just a powerhouse for our chapter. Um, and uh, she, she also is, buys a lot of plants at our nursery. So we're grateful for her for that as well. Um, and she's a, another nursery she really enjoys is Larry Voss's Linda Vista, Linda Vista Natives Nursery, uh, which is a small nursery in San Jose. And I have to put in a plug for Larry as well. He has a lot of plants that you can't find other places. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Penny, go ahead and grab the screen. All right, let's see, get in here. All right. Okay, so um, this, welcome to our, our native garden. This is, we're up near Alamock Park, which is why <laughs> it's named near Alamock Park. Uh, we've been here for about 32 years now and we've been doing natives since about, uh, about 1991 or 92. Uh, a lot of my plants I got because I was inspired by Allen Rock Park. We will, took walks in there and uh, a lot of them I, I fell in love with. Uh, I, I had a part in my, my presentation with lots of the photographs from the park, but it, my presentation was too long, so I had to delete them, but a lot of them are in the garden now anyway. So uh, when we moved here, it turns out that there are a lot of uh, native plants here already. There were five coast live oak and three incense cedar, which are actually from the Sierra, but they seem to be doing okay here. And then there was a huge long uh, swath of probably on hedges. But at the time we moved in, it looked like lollipops because the deer came through and mowed them down. <laughs> Uh, and I found out uh, two ground covers we have, a Lithia and a Pony's foot, which is a dichondra, are both natives. And I only recently found out while I was doing this presentation that the Modesto ash we have in the backyard are also a Southern California native, and they're also called uh, Arizona ash. So, uh, so the first part we, of our uh, garden we did was in about 1991 and 92, and I can't remember exactly. We had an area in the, in the front at the street that was all ivy, uh, hate ivy. <laughs> and so got a hold of a Native Revival Nursery over in Aptos. 
and they came and uh, designed the garden and put it in for us. It's changed a lot over the last 27, 30 years. So uh, two of the things that are still here are the holly leaf cherry, blue-eyed grass, a lot of verbena, and of course the California fuchsia, the epilobium canon, 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 canon. Um, some plants we lost a deer damage. The uh, deer love to rub their antlers on the Ceanothus and also on the Malva Rose, and I lost both of those. And this year we've been overrun with moles, and now the gophers have arrived. So, but all the bright side on the uh, deer haven't come by since the shelter in place orders because I think. I think they're staying down in the park. They have no humans to contend with. And so I've gotten to see some blossoms that usually they eat before I get a chance to see them. So this is our front yard. This is the area here on the on the right that was all ivy. And, uh, actually, this area over here was all driveway. I'll get to that a little bit later. Penny, is it possible for you to get a little closer to the mic? It's a, it's a, you're a little quiet. Oh. I think people are having a little okay. trouble hearing you. Um, I'm just going to see if I can. I don't know how to, I can get closer. Yeah, I don't know if I can turn it up now. I thought I had it up high enough. <laughs> That's actually better. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'll, I'll speak louder too. Uh, this is the holly leaf cherry in bloom this year. Um, and here we have lots of poppies. The poppies went crazy this year, talking about trying to control the poppies. I think maybe the moles helped disperse the seeds because I have poppies where I never had before. This is some yarrow that was um, reseeded itself from the main area of the street. And these are the flowers that I never get to see that the uh, deer left alone this year. And this is a little, tiny little lupin, bicolor lupin that grows in the park. Has little tiny white, blue, and white flowers. Really sweet little plant. And this, I don't know where it came from. This is a desert phacelia that popped up last year and um, came back this year with three plants. But, uh, sweet little thing. This is another plant that grows in the park. Uh, I love it. It's just one of my favorite plants. Uh, I have a lot of favorite plants. This is Datura ridei or Sacred Datura, also called Jimson weed. It is poisonous. Uh, Cow farmers don't like it because it's poisonous to the cattle. Uh, so here we have some gilia that was in the backyard years ago and died back, died off, and it showed up last year. I assume maybe the birds or maybe the moles again, I don't know. <laughs> um, and here we have some lysingia. It has a new name, but I can't pronounce it. So. And it blooms later in the summer, and this is a little flower that it has. It can spread to be two or three feet across. This is uh, Nevin's Barbers over here. Uh, this was planted last year, so this is its first full year. I had Oregon grape before, but it grew way too rampantly. It spreads by underground runners, and it's spread by receding, and the thorns on it or the leaves are just vicious. So. I had it taken out and, and trying uh, the Nevis Barbary instead. This is the uh, Verbena Lattacina. And I have two of them, but there's another one right behind this one. And this is Epilogium Canum, the California Fuchsia. And these are a couple, you can hardly see them here, a couple of um, a narrow leaf milkweed that, that I just put in last year. So one of them already has some like it's some flower buds, so hopefully it'll bloom again in this year. Uh, this is a, a toy on, a volunteer toy on that sprouted up a few years ago, came from the backyard. And this is the woolly blue curl. One of my other favorite flowers, <laughs> plants, some of the poppies. And this is the, the rest of the front yard over here. Um, this is a Cleveland sage. And this is a a couple of close-ups of the blossoms. And this is looking north, north to the foothills. And, and this is area over here is north of Alma Park. And this is one of my favorite friends, the deer. The stags only come out in mating season. They stay in the park otherwise. So this was probably taken back in, in the fall. 
And this is the coyote mint. Uh, this, this may have been origi an original plant. I kind of dies back and then I cut it back and it comes back again. It's just an amazing plant. And again, we have the holly leaf cherry in blossom. And these are, again, a close up of the blossoms. And again, we have almost the same photograph of the, the cherries developing, the bright green new leaves. And these are the little cherries. I, the ground is covered with these little cherries. I think it's set too many seeds and I can't support them all, so they're dropping. Near the house, near the front of the house where it was planted, there was a large section of gravel. Uh, driveway that we had removed. It was just so hot and so ugly. And we added the topsoil and made a revival, put in the flagstone pathway as well. There is uh, overhead spray irrigation there, but it's broken and I have no desire to. I was thinking about putting in drip irrigation, but I, I just prefer to do it by hand, whatever is needed these days. And this was the driveway when we moved in. I called it the parking lot. <laughs> it's great for when you have parties, but not very nice to look at. And so this, this is it now. We have three large Dr. Herds. Well, this is the large Dr. Herd, and then there's two smaller ones back behind it. And this one has suffered a lot of dieback this year. I'm not quite sure what's going on. This is a, a, a rare... Arctostaphylus pumilia from Monterey County, uh, sand mat or sand manzanita. I had several more of these, but they died as well. So I don't know if there's some virus or something in the soil that's bothering the uh, uh, manzanita. This is just another close up of the manzanita. You can see some of the dye back here. And these are the smaller ones in the back. The deer, before we put the fence in, in the back, used to come down behind the hedge, come around here, and then they would munch on this one first. And then when they got most of the leaves off that one, they would move on to the second one. So that's, that's my theory about why they're, they were all planted at the same time, but these two are obviously much smaller than the other one. But they have the same beautiful red bark. And here we have some Heterotheca San Bruno Mountain. And this is a, uh, Douglas iris, uh, just a close up of the Douglas iris in the flower. Oh, and this is the uh, Arctostaphylus pumilia again. This is all one plant. It's about my only one left. Yeah. These are canyon snow iris. I had a lot of iris in the backyard and they had to be divided, so I had them bring some of them up here in the front. There are three groupings. And this little grass over here is Festuga uh, Siskiyou Blue. It does better with a little bit of shade, so this one's kind of struggling. It gets maybe more sun than it wants. And over here, uh, this is all Bees Bliss. And these are just some Dutch iris that I love, Dutch iris. Uh, bees Bliss is true to its name. It is a magnet for bees. Honeybees love it, but also the bumblebees. And more bees bliss. And this is a, a sticky monkey flower that I have in a pot. And this is some uh, coastal daisy that's in a pot with it. And back behind here is a spice bush. I have it I usually covered with a screen to prevent the deer. Now, since the park opened a couple of days ago, I've noticed I had my first fawn in the front yard this morning. So I guess the deer are back. Uh, and this is just a closer close up of the uh, monkey flower and the um, coastal daisy. And this is another uh, little uh, sticky monkey flower that I got from the nursery that's just, just starting. I put it in the ground and I'm hoping to replace uh, a lot of this mandina that's across the front that we put in when we first moved in. And I think that's it for the front yard. Yeah, okay. So in the backyard, we called on Central Coast Wilds in 2010. Uh, Central Coast Wilds is down in Santa Cruz, and they do a lot of restoration work. I know we get some of their plants for the restoration work up at Alamark Park. Uh, we, originally, the back area was a lawn, and we sheet mulch that with newspapers and arbor mulch. And then 
Central Coast Wilds came in and about two months, maybe two or three months later in the fall and planted. We decided we didn't want them to do a, a pathway, but then we discovered after a while that we really needed a pathway. So we got some flagstone and did that ourselves. There's no uh, for, in, irrigation here. I just do it by sprinkler, hose in sprinklers and, and by hand. And I had trouble getting annuals to start to grow where I wanted them. So I put them in pots and put the pots where I wanted them to grow. And that seems to have worked. So I've gotten some uh, Chinese houses and some Clarkias to grow. OK, and this is one of the ash trees. And this is the big cedar tree. And this is a Salvia Dero's choice. There's actually two of them here. This is Hookera. This is the Hookera Maxima. And then this is some humming, hummingbird sage. There's more of it down in the, the backyard, a bigger patch. These are just some close-ups of the hummingbird sage. It's really pretty when the sunlight comes behind us through these flowers. They're really pretty and striking. And this is just a close-up of the Dara's Choice sage, a very nice sage, low growing. This is about as tall as it gets, which is maybe two feet. And uh, it does need to be trimmed back every now and then. And again, it's more of the hookara over toward the middle of the yard. And we have a little cat mint over here. And there's some, another cat mint on the other side. And there's some Dudleyas back here. And this is the Dudleya. This is a chalk Dudleya. These are the flower stalks beginning to, to come up. And this is a, the uh, uh, Canyon Snow Iris, some of the ones that we got. Um, this isn't the patch that was divided. This one needs to be divided probably next year. This is a patch of uh, dark purple iris. I don't think I got a picture of that one this year. And then all this greenery over here is Yerba Buena. It started on the other side of the path and like it took a long time to get going, but once it got going, boy, it took off gangbusters and I don't mind it. I, I just love it. It smells good. And when I walk on it, it smells good. And here's the chalk dudley again with the flower stalks are getting taller. They, they actually have uh, buds on them now. They're probably just in a week of, of blossoming. And this is a blazing star, Lindsay, Lindley's blazing star. I can't get it to grow in the ground, so I grow it in a pot every year. And I just love the flower. And our chapter's newsletter is called The Blazing Star. So maybe that's one reason I like it so much. And this is, well, this is a sulfur buckwheat here. It's, I have to keep cutting back the, the uh, Yerba Buena. It wants to take over. And this is just a little flower, uh, Yerba Buena. And this is Calamagrostis foliosa. I have several, but this is a, the be better looking one. I do water back here in the summer, um, probably because the trees take up so much water. And if I don't, nothing will survive. And this is a uh, uh, red flowered buckwheat. I can't remember now <laughs> the formal name of it. Lost it. And these are Clarkia amoana. Farewell to spring. They're one of the later Clarkias to bloom. And this is some more of the uh, fescue. Uh, uh, what's the, I've lost that name too. Sorry, I'll go back on. This is elegant Clarkia. It runs along the side of the house. The rest of the side of the house is our, our work area. So I just took pictures of these two that are at the corner. These are shooting stars. Sally Casey used to sell these at the uh, flower show and at the plant sales. And they're in a pot, so I remember not to water them in the summer. They don't like summer water. And this is a view of more of the whole yard. Uh, and over here on the right side is some columbine. This was the original plant, but it looks like it's dying back now. And uh, you can tell it's receded. There's some across the way, too. And these are some Chinese houses that that's where the pot was last year. So they grew in the soil, but they're kind of stunted again because the roots take up so much of the soil, so much of the water. 
And this is another dearest choice salvia here. And here we have the Chinese houses and get in the pot again. I moved the pot so they'll go someplace else this year. This is sea monkey flower. Uh, it's in a pot because it just wants so much water that I can't possibly grow it in the ground. Yeah. And the flowers are very sweet little flowers. Here we have the columbine. This in the back here is redwood sorrel in a pot, again, because it likes a fair amount of water. And this is a little thing called firecracker flower. It's a relation to the blue dicks. It's a uh, Cyclostemma idemia. And then this is columbine again. Interesting little flowers. The area below the boxwood hedge and below the, the front area we just saw was just planted with toyon and nothing that well I shouldn't say nothing else over to the north side and under the oaks there was tons of uh, invasive vinca major and where there wasn't vinca major there was lots of oxalis so I spent probably four or five years getting rid of that cutting it back pulling it out I must confess I use can, Confess I used some, some Roundup on them when they would first come back after I cut them back. I would use a little Roundup and that seemed to do the trick. Um, uh, I think that's here. The last couple of years I've had some health problems, hip, hip arthritis and other things. So I've hired um, Rebecca Schoenenberger and her crew from Native California native scapes to come out and help me with some of the maintenance and the planting. So these are the toy on hedges that I mentioned before. And you can see now that they are full hedge-like, going down to the bottom. The birds like to nest in them, hide in them. Lizards like to hide in them. The cat likes to take a, a nap in them. <laughs> uh, down here is a red bud. And over here, I'll, you'll see it closer, but that's a buckeye. And over here is a Elderberry. The elderberry was a volunteer, somebody got the seeds. And here is the buckeye. Uh, interesting story. It was in a tiny little pot, a foot cubed pot for probably five or six years. And I finally decided to bring it down here and put it in the garden. And I was sure it wouldn't do much. I thought it was root bound, but it, it's kind of sat for two or three years and then it took off. And, this is my very first blossom. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and this is the red berry plant again. I didn't get out to get pictures of it when it was blooming, but it's just gorgeous when it's in bloom. And here are the lovely seed pods. And over here are the, the leaves. Every year I get leaf cutter bees that come and make these little cuts. And uh, they line their nests with those. The egg, egg laying the larva. And this is Hooker's Evening Primrose. And these are some Clarkias uh, that are kind of on the downside. Here's a California grape. And this is a fuchsia flower gooseberry. And this is just some close up of the flowers of the Hooker's Evening Primrose. It is aggressive reseeder. And so I need to be sure I get out here and, and cut the seed heads off before they open up and spread more seeds. And this is a this low growing, it's a Clarkia davii. It's something else that Cat, Sally Casey used to sell in their um, spring flower show and at the, at the nursery for scholarship funds. And this is a, a wine cup Clarkia. And it's just a close-up of the, of the flowers. Just a sweet little plant. It recedes readily too, but I don't mind it because it covers the ground. <laughs> and this is the wine cup parky again. Tiny little flowers, tall, tall plants. These are just some early pictures of the fuchsia, fuchsia flowering gooseberry that I took earlier. I think this was last year's. So this year it's grown even, even more. It was just covered in berries this year, but I didn't get flowers. I didn't get out to take a picture. And this is the one of the California honeysuckle. Uh, honey, 
and the flowers. It, all of these these grow in Elm Rock Park, as well as the uh, fuchsia flowering gooseberry. And this is a, a golden current. It's not taken hold very well, again, because the cedar roots are right, right there. And I do water it extra, but it's just being slow to take hold. I hope it takes off next year. And this is Dutchman's pipe vine. Uh, I had it in the ground, but it was struggling because of the, the water hogging cedar roots. So I put it in the pot. And uh, it seems to be doing OK. And this is just the cute little flowers. These are two Sticky monkey flowers that the birds brought in. And they seem to be doing okay. This is the elderberry tree. It's about probably about four years old now. It's gotten up quite tall. And there's the, uh, the blossom from it. Here we have Avis Keedy, uh, hummingbird sage. And back here is woodland strawberry. This all started with three plants probably 10 years ago, it's gradually, gradually spread <laughs> over to the other side of the tree as well. And this is just a close up of the Avis Kitty. Starts out with a yellow, kind of yellowish blossom, and then it fades to white. And here's the soap root lily. Uh, and more of the woodland strawberry. And this is the first year I managed to get out when it was blooming. Um, blooms really late for me. It's about 7.30 that the flowers open up because this is in, in shade most of the day, except for when the sun starts to set, it gets low on the horizon. And there's actually a bumblebee out here, but he was hiding under all the flowers and I couldn't get a good picture of him. This is the ground cover lithia that I mentioned that was here when we moved in. And uh, it does fine, it'll do fine without water, but it will do much better with water and it spreads better with water. And there's just a close up of the, of the flowers. The tar, it's quite a bit of traffic. I walk on it, not every day, but um, quite often during the week. The other area that's down below was really graded when they fixed the lot. And so the area right above the toy on hedge and right below it, a really poor soil. They scraped most of it off. The area further to the north, um, under the oak trees, where of course it's soiled much better from years and years of oak leaf compost. So this is the toy on hedge heading north toward the cedar tree, and it the hedge ends right there. This is a, a salvia bees bliss. Not a great picture, but I put just a cutting in there from uh, the front yard, and this is probably four years later, and it's all one plant. And then this is just looking down from our deck uh, to the water feature, the bird bath, and the end of the toy on hedge. The birds love to sit on, the bigger birds sit up here on the branches and wait their turn for the bird bath, and the smaller birds sit in the toy on and wait their turn. And we get tons of uh, cedar waxwing here early, late winter, early spring and when they're migrating. And here's the two robins taking a bath and here's a, our gray fox coming through getting a drink. They also get raccoons. I, I can tell when the raccoons are in here because the water is all muddy and I cleaned it out. This is another one of my favorite plants. This is um, Canyon Snowflower, Sunflower, um, and Agassia carbosoides. And actually, these two plants died last year. Um, luckily, I had given some cuttings to people, and I got some cuttings back from them, and I'm growing, so I'm going to start it again next year, I hope. I just love this plant. This is a close-up of the flowers. Very soft green leaves. It does go dormant in the, in the winter. This is a, a grass that grows in Elm Rock Park. This is Tori's Melica. And it's a very graceful, gentle, kind of flows downward toward the slope. And the bird bath again, and some garden art down here. These are the four, four of the big oaks that were planted. Obviously, they planted way too close together, um, but they've done okay. 
This is a California polypod fern, just about going dormant. And this was taken last year. Uh, this is the globe lily. It grows up in Alamo Park, one of my the first plants that I plants that I noticed that I really fell in love with. And so I was able to get one and bring it down. And this is a bee plant. It has a similar plant to the um, snowberry plant, only slightly redder, uh, but no, no berries afterwards. This is a chaparral current here, and these are three California fescue. This is the chaparral current in bloom, and it's a kind of a pink, again, a pink, uh, pinkish color at first, and then it kind of blends out to, to white as it ages. And this is ocean spray. You saw that beautiful picture uh, in the last garden. This has been planted for two years now. And I'm hoping it turns into what she has growing. <laughs> the soil here, even though this is under the oaks, isn't quite as good, so I'm uh, holding my breath. And this is an area down right below the Toyon hedge, but close to the oaks. So it's a little, little more, a little better soil because it gets more oak leaves. This is a, another really blue curl down here on the side is a checker bloom. Lots of Blue-eyed grass, the blue-eyed grass reseeds itself everywhere. Um, I have to pull some of it out at times because it just covers the, the uh, path. And this is a salvia leucophylla. Uh, it's um, sapphire bluff, I think it's called. And again, this is the woolly blue curl two months after that last picture. And, in full bloom. And this is along, the oaks are just above here. And this is looking south toward the uh, blue, blue curl. And here's the chaparral current. These are more of the Clarkia emolina and our friendly little donkey. More of the emolina. And this is June grass, a uh, nice little uh, clumping grass, pretty little flower stalks and they, they turn tan later on and they wave in the breeze, very, very nice. Uh, this is a little close up of the cheddar bloom and you can see the blue-eyed grass is just really dense here. And there's the uh, salvia up there, a little bit in bloom. This is uh, some a pencil and margarita bop. Um, after the first year when it bloomed, I was looking for something to cover the bank. And so I cut off the seed heads and just threw them up on the bank. And I now have probably 15 or 20 of them up there on the bank, which is great because it's hard to get things established up there. This is the Toyon hedge and all the seed heads popping up. And here are some close ups of the flowers. The bees, I was just out there today, and the bees, the honeybees, the bumblebees, little sweat bees, all kinds of bees were buzzing around. They just love the, the flowers. Okay, this area, this is the back area. Um, the worst, this is where all the Vinca Major was, and the Oxalis was all down the hill. Really a hard place to get things started. <coughs> Excuse me. Penny, I just wanted to give you a quick time check. Uh, you got I know. over just slightly, but go, yeah. go ahead. You can still, if maybe if you could wrap up though in the next. Yeah, there's just a, a few more, few more slides. The last. Thank you. So here we have more blue-eyed grass, and this is a sugar bush over here. And this is over here is Cobb Mountain lupin. And over here. Oh, there's more blue-eyed grass, but this is the silver bush lupin. And you can see the Cobb Mountain lupin up here. And these are all probably Clarkia and maybe some blue-eyed grass. We'll skip that one. Uh, this is the Medlia poppy that I planted uh, last year. So this is its second year. And down here is a Malva rose. 
And the flowers, I just love these flowers. I had one out in the front yard, but the deer just destroyed it. And then what was left of it, the wind blew over this year. So I was glad I had taken a cutting. And this is the sugar bush in bloom. Um, and I think that's, that's just the, the seed heads as they're starting to dry out. This is a holly leaf red berry, grows in the park. And it's just a beautiful plant when it's in, in when the berries are, the flowers are insignificant, but the berries are go just gorgeous, especially if the sun's behind them. You know, they're almost translucent. And this is the uh, pitcher sage. And again, the June grass back behind it. And this is a sage, I'm not sure what it was. It had, it was labeled black sage, but people have told me that it's not black sage, but it's very nice. And then this salvia apiana. And some more elegant clarkia here. And Salvia Appiana. And this is Jones's Mallow. Uh, very soft, graceful plant, little pale pinky lavender leaf flowers. And these are some California grape. Trying to get started on the fence. And that's it. Hope you found something useful or interesting and uh, be glad to answer any questions if there are some. Hi, okay. Um, um, I don't know how much time we have, so I'll probably, I'll, um, there were a number of questions about watering, about how often do you water um, and do you hand water or irrigate and how much do you do? Um, so there's, a watering question. Well, I'm, I'm retired, so I have lots of time. Um, as far as watering, in the backyard, up where all the, you know, the ash trees were, I, I water by sprinkler maybe twice a month in the summer, and then I water other things by hose if, if I think they need them. Right now, everything's pretty well established, so I don't have to water quite as much, but if I don't water at all, then the, uh, the salvias start to get really die back, a lot of brown leaves and other things look un really unhappy. In the front yard, I hand water. I don't use the sprinkler as much, but I hand water uh, again as needed. It's just if things look like they're drooping or starting to get brown leaves at the bottom, I'll, I'll water. Uh, when the hot spell came, I watered right before it came, and then I watered right after it left uh, these last two hot spells. So it's just kind of playing it by ear. Um, okay. I hope that so answers the question. What yeah. is uh, Yerba Buena one of those plants that needs extra water, or is it pretty happy back there? Well, of course, it gets the water when I water for the trees, so I don't have to water it any more than that. Um, when I first trying to get it started, it took a while, but it's it's pretty hardy because I have it in some pots and uh, you know they drape down and I don't water the pots all that often and they do fine. Okay and I just want to point out that Vivian there was a question about the, the botanical name for Canyon Sunflower which is at the C CNPS nursery. Um, botanical name is there and I put the link for the nursery in the chat. Um, oh, okay several places. And okay, some questions about your toy on hedges. Yes. Uh, how often and when do you prune the toy on hedges and how old are they? Well, like I say, they were here when we moved in 30 years ago. And I'm thinking that the, the owners, the first owners, we're the third owners of the house. I'm thinking the first owners must have put all the gardening in because the trees are so old and so they're probably 50 years old, maybe. Wow. And we prune them. My husband prunes them because he doesn't want to lose his view. And so I have to hold him back. And I try not to let them prune when there's flowers and, and uh, berries on. So at least once a year. And sometimes he gets out there and prunes off sprigs that are sticking up sooner than that. <laughs> OK. Have I missed any questions? I well, thank you know Penny. I saw your I saw your back when it was you were still working on weeding it, 
and I'm like amazed at the transformation. Thank you for sharing it. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you so much, Penny. That was wonderful. Yeah. You have an amazing garden. And I'm <laughs> I am truly impressed about the toy on hedges. I that they're that old and that you've been able to maintain them at that height. That's amazing. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So our next garden is uh, Stephanie Morris's garden, and she's been working in the field of landscape ar architecture for 25 years. She grew up in San Jose, attended Cal Poly, and she graduated th from there in 1995. She's loved gardening since she was a child, and she also loves hiking, art, and science. So landscape architecture just seemed to be a great way to combine all of these interests. Uh, at Cal Poly, she took a California native plant class and that taught her about the California plant communities and was very inspiring. So she decided that was a great focus for her work. And so she's learned from many mentors, both um, at CNPS along the way. Uh, she especially enjoys creating designs that respond to aesthetics, functionality, and ecology with an emphasis on native plants, healthy soil, water conservation, and environmentally conscious materials. Stephanie's also uh, one of our early organizers of the Gardening with Native uh, group, and she, she was really instrumental in the early days and, and ran it for quite a long time. So we really owe Stephanie quite a bit uh, with her all her efforts for our chapter. And so Stephanie, if you want to take over the screen, please go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much. Vivian and thank you. I really wanted to say thank you also to everybody who's had such a long term um, just process in making this garden tour reality. I can remember how it was in this area before we had the tour and how different it is now with everybody being able to share information and see so much and it's a ton of work and I really really appreciate it. It's been a great thing for the community. So I am going to share my screen and just play a video that I made of my garden this year, this spring for the tour when we found out we were going to shelter in place. The video is 17 minutes. And then after that, um, we can talk more and I can take questions. And if for some reason the video isn't working right, please speak up and let me know right away. Hi, I'm Stephanie Morris and I am going to take you on a garden tour today of my native plant garden in Campbell. Enjoy the tour! I've been gardening at this location in Campbell since 2003. Some of the plants in my garden are original to the first planting I did in 2003 and some plants were added later. This is kind of my experimental garden where I try different things out and see what I can do with different plants. What grows where, how big things get. I've had a lot of surprises over the years as well as some successes and some failures. This is a Gambelia firecracker, island snapdragon. This is a great plant for hummingbirds. At the entrance to my garden are two manzanitas. Both were planted in 2003. This one is a Howard McMinn manzanita. It's about five feet tall right now. And behind it is Dr. Hurd, Arctostaphylus Dr. Hurd. This one's about 10 feet tall and shows some lovely red trunks. Both of these do very well in full sun with no summer water once they're established. Here you can see a better view of the trunks of my Arctostaphylus doctor herd. This small multi-trunk tree is a western redbud, Cercis occidentalis. It flowers in the early spring with a pink flower and has a very charming heart-shaped leaf the rest of the year.
This grouping of mounding ground covers is an evergreen, it's dwarf coyote bush, Baccarus pillularis, Twin Peaks 2. This grouping of plants is at least 10 years old. I don't need to do hardly any maintenance for these plants. I trim them back to the ground about every two to three years. Here I have a Penstemon Margarita Bop, just planted this past fall, and doing very well here on a little bit of a raised mound of soil to give it slightly better drainage. This plant is deer grass, Molenbergia rigans. It's very low maintenance, requires cutting back about once every two to three years or even less often, requires very little summer water, and is attractive to small songbirds. They like to go after the seed pods here. I enjoy its vertical upright form in contrast to the more mounding forms of the dwarf coyote bush. I always design my gardens with lots of foliage color variation and texture variation in mind. Here I have some California fuchsia, Epilobium or Zauschneria select metal. This plant normally doesn't bloom until mid to late summer or fall. And I have blooms on it this year in the end of April. And I'm wondering if it's because I didn't cut it back as much this year. This plant is a great plant for hummingbirds. Here we have a coyote mint, Monardella villosa, which is not quite in bloom yet, but it's got a few buds. It will have purple flowers in the summer that are very attractive to all different types of pollinators and butterflies. This plant has a wonderful minty smell when it's crushed. This is a sulfur buckwheat, Ariogonum shasta sulfur. This is a great plant for pollinators. As the buckwheat flower begins to mature, it will gradually start turning darker in color to a dark yellow and then eventually a more russet color. These flowers can be left on the plant. They have their own sort of a summer beauty to them. And many birds enjoy the seeds. Or you can clip the flowers off at the base of the foliage. I find that the plant reblooms a little bit more fully the next spring if the flowers are clipped off, but it will bloom either way. One thing I've enjoyed about my garden is the sitting area that we designed in our front yard. Used paving stones for the floor material, and this allows us a nice sunny spot to go out in the winter. I have California poppies which reseed themselves every year in my yard and are very attractive to native bees.
in about late April, the poppies start to go to seed. This is what the seed looks like right here. If you want more poppies in your yard the following year, you wait until these long seed pods turn brown, they burst open and spread the seeds in the ground, and they reseed quite readily. You can just let them stay in the ground and they'll come up next spring. If you want fewer poppies in your garden, you'll pull the plant out before this seed pod opens. So this is an unopened seed pod right here. Many times a California poppy will actually come back and rebloom later in the fall or even during the summer if it's given water. And the way to encourage this is rather than pulling the whole plant out of the ground is to reach down and just cut it off right here at the base, leaving the root inside the ground. And then once it gets water, it can come up again and re-sprout. This is a Butylon palmeri. This is a great plant for a hot, sunny spot in the garden. This plant is called a salvia, point sal, purple sage. It's now finished blooming by this time of year in late April. The seeds are now available for birds. I enjoy its very bright gray foliage in contrast to something like the deep green of the Baccarus pilularis. On the east wall of my house, in the morning sun, is a bush anemone, Carpentaria californica. This time of year, it's fully in flower. As you can see, the flowers are very attractive to bees. In the shade of one of my fruit trees, I have some Pacific Coast Iris. I also have a white flowering variety called Canyon Snow. This one's particularly robust and vigorous. These are holly leaf cherry. I've planted them as a narrow screen between my home and my neighbors behind me. They are in full bloom right now. Their botanical name is Prunus alyssifolia, and they attract lots and lots of honeybees this time of year when they're in bloom. They are evergreen the rest of the year. They were planted in 2003, and they were about 15 to 20 feet tall right now. You can see the taller one up there. Here's a close-up view of the Prunus alyssifolia, holly leaf cherry in full bloom, being frequented by many honeybees right now. I wanted to mention the importance of a thick layer of wood chip mulch for the native plant garden. What I have here 
are wood chips that I got for free from a local arborist. I use about a four to six layer minimum of wood chips in my native plant garden. I've done some experimentation in my garden and I found out that when I keep the soil bare, the plants fare significantly worse when the weather starts to get hot. So the wood chips do a great job at keeping the soil moisture in. One of the great things that a wood chip layer also provides for the soil is that as the wood chips break down, there's a lot of microbial activity that happens in that layer where the wood chips and the soil meet. And allowing that microbial environment to be very healthy and very strong allows the soil to be healthy and therefore the plants can then be healthy as well. Before I place my four to six inch layer of wood chips, I use cardboard. I place the cardboard right on top of the lawn or the soil. You can see that where my cardboard meets the pavement, I've left at least three to four inches of space. And that's so that when I push the wood chips up against it, my wood chips aren't too high in relationship to the paving. So I lay down the cardboard and then I cover that right over the top with the wood chips. And generally that cardboard will last about four months, sometimes six, it really depends on what season you place the cardboard down. And the cardboard provides a great benefit for that first rainy season's weeds. It will suppress most of the annual weeds. And as the cardboard naturally breaks down, it will also help provide nutrients to the soil. The driveway lets water soak in and it flows into a base underneath which is compacted pervious base rock and can recharge the groundwater.
Okay, that concludes the video. I hope everybody was able to hear it okay. Well, yeah, that was great, Stephanie. Wow. I'm glad it came through. Okay. Um, Do you have any questions? I'm well, going to try to fix my lighting so it's not so fuzzy. Okay, are there any questions? From, uh, none from YouTube. Okay. Um, well, I actually have a question, which I didn't put out there for everyone by mistake. Um, how do you keep your carpenteria, so your California anatomy, so nice and full? Um, do you prune it? Um, you have one of the best looking carpenterias I've seen. So I do prune it and I'm, I'm kind of a lazy pruner, I'll be the first to admit. I am really busy and so sometimes things get my attention and sometimes they don't, which is why native plant gardening is a great fit for me in part. But um, I have pruned that one down and usually what I will do is I will take the old canes and cut them all the way down as far as I can go, like almost to the bottom. And I actually tried uh, coppicing the carpentaria a couple times. So I cut the whole entire plant to the ground and it came back up with all entirely fresh new green foliage and looked wonderful. So the picture in the video that the image that I showed, I that one's probably not been cut back for a year or so, but I do uh, at least kind of trim off the dead wood. I notice it gets very woody and it'll, it'll go through this time of the year where it kind of gets yellowish brown leaves and I just I cut that out yeah it's also uh in a fair amount of shade both of the ones I have on my property only get morning sun and they get shade all afternoon and they seem to do pretty well in that environment with uh just the morning sun okay well it's really interesting to, to hear how how uh, actually fiercely you cut it back so uh, <laughs> I think I have to be sterner with mine yeah, I've done some some really interesting coppicing experiments with toyon, which comes back amazingly. You can cut toyon to the ground. This is always once it's established, of course, once any plant has roots. But um, toyon, bush anemone, uh, western redbud as well. A lot of them, when I when they just start looking bad, I will cut them back if if it if it works with the overall landscape scheme that I'm doing. Okay, so there's another question. Did you consider a driveway that allows plants to grow on it? Allows plants to grow. I'm wondering if that means the, um, like the cinder block with holes in it or something. Okay, so actually my driveway, it probably didn't come through in this video, but my driveway has two cutouts where I actually do have plants growing in it and they, um, they grow underneath where I park my car. So I have two little slots and underneath the, the slots are, is planting. And I did, I did actually, with my husband, we, we talked about this for years. We talked about, uh, he first proposed grass pave, which I shot down because I didn't want to water or maintain any lawn at all. And the driveway is also exceedingly hot. It's, uh, it faces south. And um, so I looked at pervious you know, different types of pervious paving stones. I looked at doing part of it in gravel. And ultimately this was the product I liked the best because I've had a long-term relationship in part with the owner of the company, Ryan Marlinghouse, who used to um, own Earthcare Landscaping for years. And um, I love it because it's zero maintenance and I just water those two little narrow slots where I plant and then, um, I've got some greenery and it it's, uh, lets all the water soak in. So I feel like I'm recharging my, my land. Um, I've used with various other clients, the hydroflow pavers, uh, various types of perving, pervious paving stones that have gaps in them that let water through and gravel pave and other different products. And um, they're all great in various applications. And for this case, we wanted something that was going to be very stable and not have any gaps because we have older relatives who come over and they park their car on that part and need to get out and I did not want them to fall down. So that was a other primary consideration for us. Well, if you have any um, good sources for people to weigh alternatives like this, um, maybe, you know, type them into the chat if you get a chance. Yes, I'll type the, the um, email, the uh, website. And 
about the, you know, um, do you add more cardboard after the first time is another question when I'm talking about your mulching and how often do you renew the mulch? Those are great questions too, yes. So I um, generally, it depends a little bit on how thickly I've planted the, the planting design. So in designs where I've put a lot of plants and I'm going to have those fill in within two to three years, I generally don't have to replace as much mulch because the plants just start covering the ground entirely. But I would say an average is about two to three years. And it's somewhat subjective because somebody might want their garden to look much cleaner. Um, some people might do a thicker layer and leave it for years. So for me, it's about two to three years. I haven't ever added cardboard for the whole entire landscape after the first time, but I have done sections where I've had particular challenges. Um, one such place is where the pathway and the landscape adjoin. So that spot often gets little weeds right along the edge because the water runs off the pathway and it's a great little growing ground for weeds. So one year I kind of excavated that area, put down cardboard and then put mulch back and, and that helped a little bit. So it's kind of spot cardboard use. And the way I would do that is just pull away any wood chips I have, put the cardboard down and then place the wood chips on top of it. Okay. So uh, another question, is, I mean, if you put that in the chat about what the product name is for your porous concrete, that would yes, be fantastic. I did, it's called perviousproducts.com. And um, the product itself is called Perk Top. I'll put that in there too. Okay, and how have your neighbors reacted to your front yard? Were any of them inspired to plant natives? <laughs> so yes and no, none of my immediate neighbors. However, most of them are renters and, um, but they have responded positively. Um, one of my neighbors across the street has poppies now in her little garden, which is really neat. Um, I should mention that I did have a neighbor who lived across the street and one house down who decided to have me design their native plant garden and they subsequently sold the house. But before that, they did have me design a native plant garden. So that was kind of fun that they wanted to do that. Um, and then I have another neighbor who just has what they told me was a native plant garden, but it actually isn't, it has not a native in it. And I had to educate them a little bit. <laughs> Um, there's also on Campbell Avenue, which is one street over from mine, there are two native plant gardens. And I don't think that they had anything to do with me, but it's it's fun when you walk the neighborhood to see other native plant gardens in your neighborhood, which is something I never would have seen in 1998, 99, when I moved back to the area as an adult. So it's kind of fun. Okay, are there any other questions? I. I love your video. Thank you. And those yeah, thank you. <laughs> a lot of fun to make it. I learned a lot making it. <laughs> thank you, Pat, uh, Stephanie. And boy, the before and after pictures of your house, that was incredible. It's uh, you, what a wonderful transformation. Just amazing. I always encourage anybody who's doing a native plant garden to take tons of pictures before and especially the first year or two because you will not think things are growing and changing. And then you look at your pictures and you kind of go, oh, wow, yeah, these plants are really growing, so. Actually, I have one last question, um, sort of about that transformation. Is there anything that now, when you look back, you wouldn't have done? And is there anything in particular that you're expecting to have happen in terms of the mature, as the, the garden matures? Um, yes, and I would probably just have to keep my comments limited because I could probably talk for like 30 minutes about things I did wrong. <laughs> so so um, I planted a number of things that I did not expect to get as large as they did. So that was a learning experience for me. And even though I read all the, you know, the information, I asked people, I studied, I went on garden tours, um, you know, and this was my second home garden. I even had a garden for six years prior to, to moving into this home. So um, my elderberry tree got humongous, absolutely humongous. And um, it, it's why when you look at my house now, it does look a little bit bare in the front yard because there was an elderberry tree there for years and it grew super, super fast and got to be about 25 feet tall and started to heave my pavement and then it actually died in the drought because I didn't water it. Um, I, it just was just too much. I couldn't bear to water it anymore. It was already too big and I started spending a lot of money pruning it. 
And then I had to remove a large toy on, which was absolutely beautiful. And it really was disappointing and heartbreaking to have to remove that, but it was just too close to the house. And my vision for it was more of like an espalier and it just needed to be bigger than what I had planned for. So, um, so yes, I've learned a ton of different things. Um, some of them have come to fruition, like my Prunus alyssifolia hedge in the back has been fantastic because a large building was constructed back there and I have a little more privacy now. And, um, and my, my manzanita, I love my manzanita. It's, it's really fun to have been here long enough to see that um, getting mature. And um, I have a lot of clients who don't wanna plant manzanitas because they, they take a while, they're slow. And, um, but they do mature and it's, it's worth the wait, I think, so. How large was it when you start it started the man's in, oh it was just a small one gallon it you know it was maybe six or eight inches high something like that so wow it is gorgeous it really yeah. is. and I pruned it one time in uh since when I planted it 2003 so I've only pruned a few few branches just a couple minor structural branches so that's that's to me is the complete definition of low maintenance pruned it once and however many years it's been um, and I don't ever water it at all. And it, it just, it provides great habitat in the winter and early spring and looks beautiful all year round. So I'm a true advocate of manzanitas. Well, thank you so much. Your garden is amazing. The video was wonderful. Really appreciate you spending the time with us this evening. Yeah, well, thank you, Vivian, for, I mean, this has been a great series that you started and thanks for championing this, championing, championing this and um, letting this, this forum become available and supporting it and doing all the tech to get it going. Thanks. And so before we drop off, I'm just gonna do a quick share um, and walk people through our website and the GNGT site. So if folks want to look at the gardens again, Stephanie's video is available on the GNGT site. So if you have anything that you wanna look at again, you can do that by going to the site. So let me just do that. I'm gonna do a quick screen share here. And if you, you guys should be able to see uh, the CNPS chapter website, which is at cnps-scv.org now. Uh, if you're interested in shopping for plants, right here at the very top of the site, there is this link to go to our online nursery. So I'm just going to click that real quick so you can see what it looks like. Uh, it's gives you a little bit of information about the shopping experience. And then to see what we have, just click the shop now. And we are gonna be adding more plants and uh, updating our inventory numbers on Monday. So you're certainly welcome to shop now and, and place orders, but just be aware that more plants will be coming into the shop uh, on Monday. And now I'm going to show you how to get to the Gardening with Native site. You've got many ways to get there from our top level. Um, over here on the main menu, there's a Going Native Garden Tour link under our gardening menu up here at the top. Um, you can also get to it here. But before I go there, I also wanted to point out that right at the bottom of this gardening menu, there's something called Gardening Resources. And I'll click on that and you can see a, a list of a lot of useful information. Calscape.org, I think Nancy mentioned it. It is absolutely the best gardening database for native plants, California native plants, highly recommend it. Uh, there's a list of places to buy native plants. So if you don't find what you want at our nursery, uh, you can click on this link and it'll show you a whole list of uh, local native plant nurseries. Um, there's a list of native plant professionals, which I actually think is one that Stephanie maintains. Um, so if you need to find someone to help you with your garden, you can go here and there's a list. Uh, so there's a lot of information here and I recommend taking a look if you are just look, if you need help with something. Um, but now if you're, you just want to do some touring of gardens, you can go to gngt.org up here and uh, you can see all the gardens from 2020 or previous year's gardens. 
And so I just wanted to show you, um, I hope I didn't do that too quickly. So go to view the gardens, this button right here, and that will show you all the garden, the 2020 gardens, including all the gardens that you saw tonight. And Stephanie happens to be right here at the top. And I just wanted to show you guys um, one quick thing about this. So there's pictures here over on the left side. It's a slideshow, so if you just stay on the page, it'll just go through those pictures on its own. You can always just set your cursor on there if there's a picture you want to, to stay there, um, but otherwise it'll keep rotating. If you wanna see videos, not every garden has a video, but um, many of them do now. And down here, if you look right under where the pictures are, there's something that says virtual tour menu. If you click that and there is a video, that will show up there. And you can see Stephanie's video. So right now we're on Stephanie's page, the Low Water co um, Cottage Garden. And you can go here down to the bottom there and do that pull down menu, go to view movie. And this is the video that we just saw. So if you wanna take a look at it again, it's available to you 24 seven. So if you're, whether it's early in the morning with your coffee or late at night, you can, you can view that video and there's plenty of others on there, lots of great gardens. And we currently don't have the next session scheduled. So please stay tuned either by join, joining our news list that I mentioned earlier or going to our website, all of those things will be posted um, also on our Facebook or meetup groups. And I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, have a great west, rest of the weekend. Thank you so much. Vivian? Oh, was there something else? Yeah, just about the uh, Jewel Flower Talk on Thursday. Do you wanna mention that? Oh yeah, uh, you know, and I realized, I don't think I put that up at the beginning. So we have a talk coming up on Thursday, uh, and it's, it's gonna be great. It's on jewel flowers, if you're familiar with them. And that will, uh, you can find the information, actually, let me just go back here. Um, oops, off our website. And it's, um, whoops, it's, I see it. Okay, I'm gonna show you on our uh, meetup group here. Oops. So over there is our meetup group. We list a lot of our um, activities on the meetup group. And so Thursday is Juggling with Jewel Flowers, uh, a talk by Justin Whittle. And that's gonna be a really interesting talk. So hopefully some of you will join us on Thursday. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Anything else anybody wants to announce? Okay, good night. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thank you.